Hello, and welcome to Business 101. I'm your professor, John Harvey. Today we're going to be covering Chapter 9, which is focused on production. Now, when I talk about production, there's uh, what I'd call three main requirements for production. And this is a general summation. The focus of production is, one, to build and deliver products that the customer is wanting. Now, that might seem obvious, but it's amazing when you're talking in a manufacturing environment how often the conversation or the reality comes up where they will focus on what it is they can produce, not necessarily what the customer is asking for. So this actually is a, a big issue, and that's why I say it's one of the first requirements of production. Next would be to provide that product or service at a very acceptable quality level. And the third is to focus on the lowest cost. So you want to make sure that you're making the right product, that you're doing it timely, that you're providing the quality, and that you're doing it at the lowest possible cost. So that's kind of the crux or the, the summation, if I could, on what production is required to do. Now, when we're talking about efficiency within production, I want you to notice here that most of the definitions or most of the measurements are in terms of time. This is done very deliberately. So when we see like Krispy, Krispy Kreme is producing 5,000 donuts in a minute, um, or let's see, Chips Ahoy producing 4,000 uh, Chips Ahoy cookies a minute. Mm, I think I'm going to want some Chips Ahoy's after this. Um, but the point is that they're looking at it in terms of time. And the reason why they're doing that is because if you think about kind of the context here, you'd have these large machines that are built to produce this product. Uh, you have l the labor force, which is focusing on maintaining that. You may have some uh, manual labor in terms of packaging or bagging or whatever, but you've got a lot of capital uh, investment in this production process. So do you want to shut it down at 5 o'clock? No way. You want to run these things 24 hours a day. You want to run them at their full capacity. And so when you're running them at full capacity, now you're really limited by time. You're saying, I've only got 24 hours to produce in. I've only got so many uh, minutes, only so many seconds. So if I can increase my production within a period of time, then I'm able to produce more and therefore uh, have a larger output like we talked about in the last chapter, you have this economy of scale, and in so doing, you actually can reduce your per unit cost. So most manufacturing, when they're trying to reduce their costs, are talking about doing some sort of large scale um, production. So even if I look at the, um, oh, let's say the auto industry here, and I look at that, I can see Ford, uh, GM, Honda, uh, you can look at all of these and figure out how many hours that it takes them to produce a car. This is a standard measurement um, across the industry there. And it's interesting to see you know, how, how low Nissan and Toyota are in terms of uh, how many hours it takes for them to produce a car. Now let's move on and talk a little bit more about... <clears throat> Now let's talk about how manufacturers have become more effective. The way that manufacturing has become more effective is really focusing in on the customers. Like I said in the first uh, requirement of production, where you're really focusing in on your customer, not necessarily what you can produce. And there is a big difference there. You maintain your close relationships with these customers. This uh, process then becomes um, part of your, your business core competency. Being tied in with a, a customer is critical for um, dealing with other competitors, um, changes in pricing and fluctuation, uh, dealing with quality issues. If you are tied in with your customer, if you've got more hooks in with them, it makes it harder for them to leave or to take on another vendor. Now I can tell you from uh, some observations and some experiences, when you have a customer that you really want to keep, you want to do everything you can to get yourself as integrated into that customer as possible. So I've seen things where um, if you're pr providing something to a customer, 
you may wrap yourself into their forecasting plan and say, hey, let me know how you're forecasting and what you're forecasting so that I can, um, you know, help produce, you know, to your forecast. Um, I think we talked in last, uh, I think we talked in last chapter, if not, we're going to cover it in a little bit, about just-in-time inventory and the focus there, which is you and that customer are now synced together in that supply chain. You know, making sure that your customer doesn't run out of product is critical for your benefit in terms of how much you can sell and in terms of how reliant or dependent they are on you. So maintain a close relationship. Focusing on continual improvement. Innovation is critical, especially in production. And we'll, we'll talk in more detail on this in a little bit. Uh, focusing on quality, obviously saving costs, um, and looking at new product techniques. That, again, that goes back to innovation. So that's how manufacturers are becoming more effective. Now, I'd like to take a step back and talk about the definitions here. When we're talking about production, we're talking about producing goods or services. And the textbook has a very uh, stated uh, definition for production. When we're talking about production management, now you're looking at kind of a larger scale. So if I'm producing something, say um, uh, a toy train, okay, my production is the toy train. But my production management is not just focused on how many trains I produce, but also in the amount of labor that went in to produce that train, the amount of raw material that needed to be procured or purchased in order to make that train, the amount of paint that it took to make that train. All of these pieces that come together in the production process is what production management is focused on. Now, I did just define production when I said it was producing goods or services. Because we're talking about services now, the term production management is seen as a little bit kind of old school, if you will. Because when you say production management, you're thinking, oh, okay, we're talking about producing things, such as trains. Well, true, but you can also be producing services. And this is a little, this is something that you kind of have to wrap your mind around. But think about it in terms of a travel agency. They are producing something that you are purchasing. It happens to be a service. That travel agent is going through and um, searching the, uh, the different prices for flights. Then they're wrapping in a hotel. They may get you a, a rental car, maybe some of the events that are going to be happening in that area. And they're putting it all together in a package and then providing that to you. Could you buy each of those individually? Absolutely. But there's a, a service that you're willing to pay for. Um, sometimes these things are transparent. You don't actually see any difference in in uh, the price, but the service that they're providing is something they have to produce. So they look at it in terms of, um, you know, their costs to get that product out to you. In this case, or that service out to you. So operation management takes into account the production of goods, but also services. So it's a way for those that are in that environment, focusing in on production, to recognize that when we're saying operations management, we could be acknowledging that there's a production of services as well. And now let's talk about some production processes. Some terms that are in this chapter, and for some of you that are in production, this is, uh, some of these things may seem very obvious, but for those that have no production experience working in a manufacturing environment, um, this, this chapter is just laden with a lot of terminology. So the first term I want to go through is called form utility. You may say, form, that's such a strange word, but the term utility is uh, meaning good or benefit. So when we're, what we're talking about here is the, um, the conversion of a product into something beneficial. And really we're talking about net result. So let me give you an example to kind of help clarify this. If, um, if I'm buying raw potatoes, I may buy them at something like, I, know, I can throw out a number, uh, five cents a pound. Now, 
if I go through and take that through my equipment, I may, um, you know, scrape off the, the skins off the potato, and that may be another three cents, right? I may uh, run it through some sort of slicer, then uh, blanch it in, in water, and then, you know, fry it in oil so that it's kind of pre-fried, and then I'll package it. And maybe that whole process there is, oh, I don't know, 12 cents, you know, I could probably break it out. So, you know, you've got your five cents for your, your raw potato, you got three cents for, you know, the, the cleaning, the de-skinning or whatever, and then the rest of the manufacturing, so like maybe 12 cents. So you're at like 20 cents for a pound of potatoes um, that runs through your, your um, product, your production line, okay? So you may be able to turn around and sell that to um, a fast food restaurant like um, like a Burger King or a McDonald's or something. What you're charging them may be 25 cents a pound or 40 cents a pound, but we'll say 25 cents. I'm just throwing some numbers out here. But your cost was only 20 cents a pound. That difference in price between what you sold, 25 cents a pound, and what was um, and what your cost was, 20 cents a pound, that five cents is your form utility. That's the benefit that you're receiving in converting that form or that product. So it's very similar to, um, in financial terms, what you'd call kind of like a net income, where you, you'd uh, take your revenue and subtract out your costs. But here in production, we can look at it in terms of um, what's the benefit in conversion of the product. In process manufacturing, you're physically or chemically altering the product. The book gives an example of uh, boiling an egg, where you take raw eggs and your process manufacturing is boiling them and then providing cooked eggs. Um, some other examples of this might be uh, taking raw sodium and chlorine or chloride and putting them together to produce table salt something like that. So you're, you're chemically, you're physically altering um, the, the makeup of something. So process manufacturing focuses on that. Now if we look at assembly process, that's my best example is that's your North Pole example, right? That's your elves that are taking, you know, pieces of wooden dowels and hammering them together to make a little wooden wagon for somebody. Right? You're taking all these different little pieces and assembling them or putting them together. A more realistic example would be an auto manufacturer. They're taking an existing tire from a company, an existing steering wheel, an existing frame, and they're putting all these pieces together to produce a car. So they're assembling this thing down the line. Now if we look at a continuous process, this is one that just runs 24-7. It goes on and on. It's a, like a large-scale, continuous thing, so it doesn't really end. Uh, example for me that I think about in this case would be like maybe oil, oil processing. So you're running this crude oil through, and then you're running it up to some different pipes, and that forces some sort of separation of the oil into these different gradients. Or you know, you do this heating or cooling as it's going through the line and that forces some sort of split in the product. So you just keep chugging and churning in oil into this, um, you know, into this uh, manufacturing, and out comes these different kind of separations. Um, <clears throat> I imagine there's some other type of a product where you're, you're like maybe straining out some ingredients or something, you know, maybe some sort of um, retreatment or recycling kind of process. But that's what a continuous process is focused on. Um, again, it's long runs, it's continuous, it's not stopping. The difference here between that and intermittent is intermittent means that you stop and you'll have to change the, uh, the equipment from time to time. Now, a potato processing plant um, fits this exactly because what happens for them is they have a variety of french fries or you know what potato products that they're producing and what happens is they actually change or adjust the equipment so they'll run a batch through stop then change out the 
um, the slicers on the potato things, maybe they'll leave the skins on, maybe they put in some sort of ingredient into the oil, so it's like a, a battered ingredient or something like that. So then they um, get a batch ready and then they run it through the line and they run, you know, 5,000 pounds or, you know, whatever the number is. So in an intermittent process, you're stopping the processes, changing the equipment or making adjustments and then running another batch through. So those are some production processes and uh, hopefully some decent examples that will help you kind of keep a mental picture of those. So when looking at all these production processes, you might ask, what increases the productivity the most? And you might be shocked by this, but uh, the number one thing that increases productivity is innovation. It's nearly half of all productivity comes through innovation. And what I'm talking about here is I'm, I'm not saying some sort of capital improvement where what you're saying is I need a new fryer or I need a new piece of equipment that's going to you know help. Granted, capital improvements definitely help with manufacturing, but it's those radical changes, those new concepts or new ways of doing things that radically changes productivity. Some examples of this, or an example that I can think about, is um, in the steel industry. For a long period of time, um, most manufacturers were using these very, very large smelting pots. And uh, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, these huge, huge um, cauldrons of boiling metal uh, were very hard to um, continue to heat and to, to drip and you know deal, but you know manufacturing environments got very good at it. You know they they figured out the best way that they could um, you know keep these things hot and best way to flip them without any problems and drain them and you know scrape off all the the dross and that kind of stuff. Then along comes this concept like maybe we can make some smaller smelting pots. Maybe we could have one um, man, one um, site have five or six of these melting uh, smelting pots, and if we got them small enough, then we can probably throw in a variety of different. Um, you know, we could separate out the metals and, and do something like that to make it a little more efficient. Lo and behold, radical change in how you're producing, um, you know, steel bars and, and rebar and, and that kind of stuff. And because of that, that huge shift, like, you know, no longer are these big ones that efficient. These small ones could be, you know, moved around if they needed to. They could be closer to where the, the steel was being, you know, pulled out from the ground. So there was a faster turnaround time. Um, it was that kind of change. It was a radical innovation, and it, it completely changed the landscape of how steel was being produced. So... Again, when you're talking about manufacturing and you're talking about productivity, bear in mind that innovation is critical. And uh, if manufacturing uh, companies are not focused in on research and development, what ends up happening is they have a finite life. They have a fixed period of time because some innovation will come up and radically change that. We saw that with uh, TVs as well. Um, if you want to do a little research on that, the vacuum tube TVs got completely replaced. Uh, this happened with uh, AM, FM radios uh, over and over. We even see this with VCRs and DVD players, right? You've got manufacturing that's very, very clearly good at producing um, video cassette recorders. And then somebody says, really, well, why don't we make this like some, something digital so that... Uh, you know, it can be transported from one medium to another. You know, let's get a higher quality, you know, smaller size. And, you know, production on a CD is like nothing. So um, radical change, right? Radical innovation in production. Um, that, that's what really increases productivity. Now I'd like to focus in on uh, computer technology. So these three uh, definitions here kind of go hand in hand and I've got an example for you at the end of this. Now computer-aided design, this is uh, what we call a CAD program and what's uh, what's so amazing about this from a production standpoint 
is this computer-aided design allowed you to draw three-dimensionally this product that you were trying to produce and get the exact requirements. Now, we probably take this for granted. You can go to Google SketchUp and do this now for free. If you go to Google SketchUp, you can take a box and you know, stretch it into a cube, and then you have the exact dimensions of that cube. But that's exactly what a computer-aided design uh, software provided. This was great for manufacturing because you could draft out what it is you wanted to build and then have the exact specifications. Before that, it was a very arduous process. But with computer-aided design, uh, these things became scalable. You know, you could take one existing product or model and then modify it for your next redesign or whatever. And, you know, the turnaround time on that was so much faster. Then came along this computer-aided manufacturing. So this is where you take, um, you know, a simple example would be something like um, you take a chop saw, you know, something that just comes up and down, you know, you slide a piece of wood under it and, and it cuts it. With the computer-aided manufacturing, what you have is that's a smart saw that knows exactly when to cut and when not to cut. And you set the system up or you type into the, the computer to say cut every three seconds or every six feet. And so you now have the computer running the actual equipment and making these precision cuts. So your quality goes up dramatically because the um, equipment now has the exact specifications typed into it. Then some brilliant person said, why don't we try and combine both of these things? Let's do the drafting of this idea and then have it integrated right into the equipment and then have that equipment produce it at the end. So when you're combining this design and the manufacturing together, now you've got this computer integrated manufacturing. And I've got an example for you here. So check this out. Okay. So in this example here, this is the, um, and this is a lab, this is kind of a test facility, but what they're showing you here is the uh, equipment pieces that go into this. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit here. Okay, so right here, this is part of the computer-aided design, the CAD part of this. So this is, you know, someone's interface. They're going in here and literally saying, okay, I want to cut here and I want to cut here and I want it span to be this thick or this depth, or, um, you know, however those specifications are. Now, the system comes in and um, it'll actually like grab the raw material here, set it on a conveyor belt, and then once it's there, now it starts moving down the line. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit more. You can see it coming around. And now you've got this lifter uh, piece of the equipment that's taking it off of the assembly line and taking it over to actually get the, uh, the production cuts. Now you can see that same piece of equipment um, picking up the raw material putting it into the uh, the other part of this equipment will, that will actually do the cutting and trimming part of this. So the obvious and exciting part of this is that you've typed this into the system and there's been no physical handling of any of this part. Right? It's all being handled. I mean, you watch here, the doors will close automatically and the cutting thing happens on its own. Now, kind of skip ahead. This is kind of one of those Mr. Roger points where uh, you get kind of excited watching this thing. There's your raw uh, metal tube, and here's the blade coming in now, and it's you know trimming off um, the excess based on that design from you know that interface where it said, okay, make a cut here and make a slice there. Dipping ahead a little bit, but you can start to see this thing uh, right here where it's making it just a second. Right here. You can see now um, that same design that we saw at the beginning of the, the clip 
where um, the computer is following those exact specifications. So the end of the clip is, you know, it pulls it back out and puts it back on the assembly line. Now, the other piece to note here with the computer integrated manufacturing is that may seem a little slow, a little bit clunky the way it's kind of moving along that, that line, but bear in mind that process, you could set that up and could it run 24 hours a day? Yeah, right? Do you need the lights on for it to be running? No, okay? You, you know, how many people do you need to actually have monitor that thing? One, you know, maybe two, right? So um, in large scale, you can see the real value of this thing. This thing can be running all the time, takes less people, takes less uh, handling, and your quality is just dead on because it's all down to the specifications of what the, the computer can handle. It, you know, handles all that variation. So these kinds of improvements in technology um, make production uh, a very exciting, you know, area to be involved in. So. Now let's talk about some production techniques. When we're talking about production techniques, we can talk about flexible manufacturing. Now flexible manufacturing, I'm gonna go back to this, uh, a couple of these examples I was using earlier. Uh, this might be where you have a saw that uh, maybe it cuts vertically, you know, up and down as uh, two by fours are coming by or, you know, logs are coming by, but you've built this flexible manufacturing where the equipment itself can be adjusted or moved around. So now maybe that same saw can now cut horizontally, right? You just need to change or adjust or flip it around, but now you're able to, uh, because of this equipment, you're able to do, you know, different kind of things with that equipment. So flexible manufacturing is one production technique. Now another is lean manufacturing. And in lean manufacturing, you are really focused in on reducing everything in the process. So you try and reduce as much clutter, as much um, slough as possible through this thing. Now we're talking about everything. So when, when we're saying that, you start looking at, um, okay, how many raw materials are going into the process? Okay, can we reduce that? Can we, you know, buy equipment or, or parts that, you know, don't have as much scrap. Then you start looking at, okay, labor time. You know, it takes this much time for the product to get from point A to point B. Can we speed that up or reduce the amount of labor, you know, involved in that, maybe through, you know, computer-aided manufacturing or something. Then you start looking at, it, okay, can we reduce the, um, the amount of space requirements for this production? I mean, you look at every part of the, the manufacturing and you try and reduce it. So you're trying to reduce your cost, you're trying to reduce your materials, you're trying to reduce everything. So um, that's really the focus of lean manufacturing. Now mass customization, this is pretty exciting stuff. Because of this uh, computer-aided manufacturing and, and also just because of this, the idea of this technique, you have these uh, companies that will allow you to customize your product through their manufacturing process. Um, I've heard examples like um, there's some car companies where you can say, you know, my height and weight is this, and they'll make sure that the, the seat is adjusted perfectly for you. The steering pedals can be raised or lowered to kind of fit your needs. Uh, easy example for me is to think about like um, maybe the Dell, you know, buying a Dell. You go onto the website and you can pick out what kind of motherboard you want, what kind of memory or how much memory you want, um, what kind of graphics card, all of these things. And then you click buy and that request runs right down the manufacturing line right next to, you know, Joe's. Uh, request and then Sally's request and then you know Bob's request and every one of those on the line is slightly different because I you know mine has a certain set of attributes and the next one has a slightly different set of attributes but because you focused on this you can do this mass customization within the production environment you have a major focus in on planning now if a company is uh, lucky enough 
to be able to have the foresight to do all of this planning, they're in a great position. Most of the companies um, only are able to do some of these things, but let's just walk through them. So facility location. What's interesting here is regardless of the size of a company, they almost always will want to put their, their facility close to some sort of transportation. Right? So they'll want to be close to the airport if they travel their stuff on, you know, by the air, by airplane or close to the train tracks if they're putting stuff on the, those um, flatbeds, you know, and, and sending it that way or close to the freeway if, you know, they're taking trucks um, to pick up their stuff and move it to customers. So facility location, one of the things that they really look at is where, um, how can they get their product out of the manufacturing facility to their end customer. And that usually comes into some sort of mode of transportation. So that's definitely one thing that they look at in terms of location. Other things can be things like, um, you know, maybe tax benefits. I know that, uh, you know, there can be some currency things. So you might have a plant up in Canada or, you know, down in Mexico or something like that. And you may do that for some sort of tax benefit. You may um, locate yourself in one state versus another based on some sort of credits or, you know, whatever the, the state or the, um, the local area is willing to kind of pony up to get you to come to their um, area and provide those jobs. So being able to locate a facility, there's a lot that goes into that, but um, one of the big ones is really that transportation thing. Now, in terms of the facility layout, this is assuming that you can, you know, that you're building a plant and you can do that kind of layout. If not, then you're kind of doing this retrofit. And uh, I can tell you, uh, walking through a couple um, uh, potato manufacturing um, sites, you know, the ones that uh, have existed for a while versus the ones where you build them from scratch, radically different layouts. So uh, the one that I was in um, was one that had been around for quite a while. And you would go in and you'd see this production line that would kind of weave around, you know, almost like an S shape. So it was kind of trying to take into account corners and, you know, the, the walls of, of the facility. Uh, contrast that with a, a, a site that uh, was built, you know, from the ground up saying, we're going to produce this thing. Um, we're going to produce French fries or whatever um, in this facility. So we're going to build it from the, from the ground up. And when you do that, you make that building as long as possible. You know, you have your raw materials coming in at one end and your finished goods coming out the other end. And it's just straightforward. You know, it's very clear. It's like, let's just run those lines straight on down. There's no curves. There's no, you know, issues there. So how you lay out the facility can be a huge thing too. And if you're fortunate enough to start from the ground up, you can really um, set out the layout to uh, be very clean and straightforward. Now, materials requirement planning. Uh, the way you normally hear this is called MRP. And this is where you're focusing in on, uh, you're getting a sales forecast. So you're asking sales or the salespeople in your company to give you some sort of projection as to what they think they're gonna sell for the next year, the next quarter, whatever that time period is. You get that, and then you start kind of translating that back into production requirements. So the sales guy may say, well, let's see, I know my three accounts are going to produce this, so my forecast is going to be 500 for the quarter. And you're like, okay, great. It's good to know. Then you go back and you're like, well, what does that mean? Okay, well, if I've got to have 500 done for this quarter, that means i got to have this much raw materials, this much uh, in inventory already. I've got to have the equipment set up in this way. I got to, you know, have staff that's ready and scheduled so that we can have all of our production done, you know, within that time frame to make sure that we get those 500 done. So MRP uh, really focuses in on that. Now, that was kind of the precursor to uh, what we call an ERP system, which is an enterprise. Uh, resource planning or requirement planning. And uh, in an ERP system, 
you take that sales forecast and that production part of it, but then you wrap in all of the other business functions. So an ERP system has your accounting in it, your inventory, your sales, your forecast, all of that stuff. Purchasing, uh, I've kind of alluded to it a couple times where I've said, you know, you've got to have raw materials and you've got to have these things. Purchasing becomes a critical part of um, planning and just of manufacturing. Having all of the raw materials and the packaging goods and all the ingredients and all the other pieces ready and available for that production line is just one of those um, essential functions of uh, production and of planning. So uh, you can't stress it enough, you know, if you've got a manufacturing environment, you've got somebody somewhere that is just really stressed out because they're always making sure they have the right amount of stuff ready for that production line. The next thing to talk about is the just-in-time inventory. Now this is a really interesting um, kind of change in production. So the example I'll use here is one that uh, hopefully once I say it, you're just going to dial it in and you'll remember this and you'll always think about this when it comes time to talk about just-in-time inventory. So if you've ever been into a Walmart um, and you go into uh, the, the soft drink aisle, you'll see these, you know, rows and, and just, you know, fully stacked with a Coca-Cola product. Now, <clears throat> have you ever noticed how little space Walmart has in terms of a back room, you know, some sort of storage area? They almost have, it's like virtually none. You know, what you see on the shelf is what they've got. You know, it's not like they've got this huge double the facility back behind these closed doors where they're stocking all this Coke. Ooh, doesn't happen. What happens is, as soon as you buy a Coke product from Walmart, it scans through their system, and that scan, that little piece of knowledge says that this Coke item has left the building, they send that to their supplier, Coca-Cola. And Coke knows, okay, we have sold this much of our product at this store, so we've got to schedule somebody to come in and stock that shelf. So you don't see the Walmart employees stocking the Coca-Cola. You actually see the Coca-Cola people, or the distributor of the Coca-Cola stuff, going into the Walmart and actually stocking it. So. I mean, wrap your mind around this. It's like they don't hold extra inventory. They don't have wasted space in the back room sitting with obsolete inventory. They have the inventory there that is available for the customer when they need it. So it's just in the right time. So just as you need it, it's there, and that's it. So this just-in-time inventory, that's the whole purpose is right when you need it that's when it's available and there's no excess inventory you really are driving that home you don't want bottles or stacks uh, some bottleneck or or uh, a huge area with inventory you want no inventory you want this line to just run straight through so in the coke example and it, you know it's just trying to drive that home as you're buying it that Squire guy or that, that Coke guy is coming in and stocking that shelf repeatedly so you never run out. And in manufacturing, it's the same kind of concept. If they have suppliers that are coming in, the suppliers make frequent deliveries, sometimes multiple times a day, of smaller amounts of product, just enough to get that line and make sure that line doesn't stop. And that's the whole focus of just-in-time inventory. The book talks about quality control and lists out several um, <clears throat> definitions or, or segments of these. And I'll kind of hit them lightly. Uh, there's a lot of detail in any one of these, and you could, you know, there are people that uh, spend their entire careers focusing in on any one of these things. But um, let's kind of give you an overview. So you might have heard of the term Six Sigma before. And what it is, is it's uh, something that was developed by Motorola. And Six Sigma is actually a statistical number. 
okay? And what it means, you know, here's a number for you to kind of rattle around in your head. 3.4 defects per million, okay? That's what six sigma means. So out of a million, um, uh, a million units, you're only gonna have 3.4 defects. Um, so the whole thing is just focused on that, making sure that you have no defects. Now you're focusing in on the quality of the product. Just a little side note, you might think that sounds like a really crazy amount of, uh, you know, very detailed focus of high quality. Uh, bear in mind, this gets applied to all sorts of things. Um, bank transactions or banks will have millions and millions of transactions that happen every day. So uh, having Six Sigma is actually, you know, kind of a baseline for them. They can't have bank transactions that fail. And when they have millions of transactions that happen in a single day, um, focusing in on that quality and making sure that those errors are like zero is a big thing. So the next two kind of fit together when you're saying the statistical quality control and the process control. So I'll kind of use those in, in uh, connection. So the statistical quality control, you're focusing in on every part of um, the production part and making sure that that works. Versus the statistical process control will actually take samples of products within each of the sections to make sure that they meet the standard. Now the purpose of that is that by the time you get an end product, you already know or you don't have to have as much check on the end product because you've been checking it all the way through the process. This can be very beneficial when you think about um, how much waste happens if you're only checking your product at the end result. Imagine this on a car, for example. You know, nobody's really checking the line and you're running this thing through and you get all the way down to the end of the line and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, this car doesn't have a steering wheel in it. Somebody forgot, right? It's like, oh my gosh, how much labor and effort have we put into this, um, into putting this car together only to have to like stop the line, back that thing up, go find an extra steering wheel and put it back in the car. No, 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 no. You're going to have checks all throughout the process. You know, you're going to be like, is the frame right? Okay, now are we working on the interior? Interior check, exterior check, you know, engine check. And you kind of have these different points. And you'll do this kind of statistical sampling process. Um, so those are a couple of the quality control things. Not to get too far into this, but uh, Edward Deming is one of these uh, great um, great stories to look at in terms of uh, quality controls and what he came up with. Um, he actually had some great uh, designs for how to increase quality. And by doing this, he said, we're going to actually cut your costs, reduce your costs by increasing quality. And here's how to do it. Now, my understanding of this is he made a pitch for this in the U.S., and it wasn't really accepted. Nobody really wanted to follow along with you know, his ideas. So he actually went over into Asia and they jumped on it and focused in on their quality through his process. And as a result, came up with cheaper products that were higher quality and we saw this major kind of shift in, um, um, in products around the 80s where uh, we started seeing all these imports coming in that had you know, great quality to them. We can point back to Deming and his concepts because of that. So uh, if you've ever got a little bit of time, go look up Edward Deming and uh, you'll find the stuff fascinating. So the Baldridge Award is something that's awarded by the U.S. government to a company for its overall quality. Baldridge uh, was a senator and so the award's named after him. So the ISO standards are the International um, Organization for Standardization. And I, I, this cracks me up because they were so close to having an acronym there. <laughs> you know, it's like International Organization for Standardization, but they went with ISO. Well, it turns out that ISO is Greek 
or uh, oneness or isos. So they were actually taking it based on that. However, I mean, they could totally switch this thing around and had a great acronym. You know, they could have just said, we're the International Standards Organization. Anyway, so the 9000 series, the reason why the 9000 series is so important is because uh, the European Union has required all vendors to be ISO certified. So if you have a product or service and you want to sell that into France or Germany or somewhere in the European Union, you have to be ISO certified. So you're going to look at this ISO 9000 and you're going to do this checklist and get yourself on that certification so that you can sell your products into uh, Europe. It's, it's very good and it's used also within the, uh, the US, but it's like a requirement for Europe. So that's kind of one of those things that's uh, worth noting. And the ISO 14000 is focused in on environmental practices. So they want to make sure that you're um, being as environmental as possible and there's some certification for that. Okay, the last part of this chapter that we're going to go through is the control procedures. So there's the PERT and there's the Gantt chart. And the PERT is short for the Program Evaluation Review Technique. I've never heard of anybody really saying the Program Evaluation Review Technique. I might have heard maybe one person say PERT before, but it's really about the critical path. And you'll hear that term all over the place. So. The PERT is how you identify the critical path. So let's get into that one, and then we'll get into the Gantt. So the PERT steps focus in on, one, analyzing the sequence of tasks that need to be done. So you're going to take whatever tasks are happening, and you're going to actually physically like draw them and put them in boxes. Next, you're going to estimate the time you need for each one of these tasks. So you start drawing these lines between the boxes. This one has to be done after this one. And then you're going to put in, you know, how long it takes to complete that task. So then you start drawing, um, you know, the, the, um, the network there, if you will. And then the last piece is you identify the critical path, which means you focus in on what's going to take the longest route through the, through the process. Now this is so um, beneficial in many areas. I can tell you that uh, those that are general contractors, they do this all the time. They will look at how long it takes for each individual process to happen. They will be lining those out and you focus in on the critical path because that is what reduces your time um, on the product. Focusing in on any of the other areas is almost wasted effort because it doesn't shorten the time. If it's going to take me five months to get this product done and I can save myself, you know, three hours by, you know, upgrading this one thing, that's worthless. If it's not in the critical path, then it's not what you want to focus on in terms of reducing time and reducing the turnaround. This is uh, used in project management all the time. It's used in construction. So uh, let's walk through an example of this thing and hopefully it will uh, drive this home and you'll be able to start using this in figuring out your college schedules and figuring out you know the directions in life and what you want to do in your job, like what steps or things you need to accomplish first. I mean, this thing's got uh, ramification and uses all over the place. So let's go through an example here. So Sandy uh, was planning a product launch. She knew that the art department was ready to work on the promotional pieces now, but they couldn't start until the strategy group established the price points and the purchasing group obtain the papers needed to make uh, the promotional piece. Establishing price points would take about a week and was dependent on manufacturing getting the cost to the strategy group. This was expected a week from today. The purchasing group indicates that the paper could be obtained locally the same day it was requested. 
Now, assuming things go as planned and based on this information, when will the art department be able to work on the promotional pieces? So, bet you didn't think you'd get a story problem like this, huh? But it's kind of real world. You know, this is, this is what happens. So I find it's easy to start backwards, okay? What are we trying to produce? Well, we need a promotional piece, okay? What's that dependent on? Well, the um, strategy group has to establish a price point, okay? And the purchasing group has to obtain paper, okay? So the promotional piece is dependent on the price point and the purchasing paper. Okay, so we got our three boxes, we draw lines between them. Okay, then it throws in this next one which says um, establishing the price point um, was dependent on the manufacturing getting the costs to the strategy group. Okay, so you've got to get a manufacturing cost in there, and that's um, the price point is dependent on that. So now you've got your last box, you put your manufacturing in there, and you draw a line between that. Then we go back through, we read through this, and we can see how long it takes. So the price point takes about a week. The purchasing the paper takes about a day, and it took about a week for the manufacturing costs. So in the simple example, my critical path is two weeks. I am dependent on the manufacturing costs, which take a week, and the price point, which takes a week, to produce that promotional piece. Now, just driving this thing home, if I can produce my, or I can get this purchase paper the same day, it doesn't matter if I can get it within the next two hours or 30 minutes or less. No, it, it doesn't matter. I need to focus in on my price point on my manufacturing cost and getting those. Any reduction in time there actually reduces the amount of time between the start of this process to the completion of it. So you focus in on your critical path, which is the longest route through the process. Now a Gantt chart is taking the same kind of information, but you're actually putting it into a bar graph. And rather than walk through another example on this, what I've done is taken the exact same example and shown you what it looks like in terms of a Gantt chart. So a Gantt chart looks at it and puts the timeline as a, as a horizontal um, bars, and then looks at the different um, steps that need to happen or different groups. So, manufacturing cost, price point, purchasing paper, lines them out and then draws lines um, where one is dependent on the other. And so it shows you that, you know, the one that's the farthest out, that's uh, how long it's going to take you to produce this stuff. So we've walked through a PERT chart, we walked through a Gantt chart, and I've driven home the idea of a critical path. Okay. So the last thing I want to leave you with in this chapter, I've talked about a couple critical things that I'd really like to drive home. One is manufacturing uh, can be about goods and services. The other thing is uh, how much innovation is, to, uh, is required within this environment. You now I, I drove that home and talked about some examples of that and I'd just like to emphasize this also on a personal level. that. Being innovative in your business, in your work, uh, is what allows you to become more efficient. Okay? We're not just talking about your reduction in time, but those innovations really are what leaps forward um, concepts and ideas. It really makes a difference in terms of um, moving things forward. And part of that is being able to take a, a risk. So I want to encourage you to not hesitate to try and to innovate, um, knowing that sometimes these things fail, and that's okay. You know, sometimes you just need to acknowledge that, hey, that didn't work, but I tried. Okay, so you know you can celebrate those um, those failures because they're items that you learn from 
and will contribute to your next success. So just leaving it kind of light here, but don't be afraid to try something new and different. Don't be afraid to try and innovate because it's those innovations that really produce the leap forward in, uh, in what you're working on. So thank you for staying uh, with me and have a good day.